essentially in the time period from when I used to make videos to now, the gender switch has happened, but it hadn't happened previously. So I could make gender critical videos and people would think it was quaint. <laughs> That's not the case anymore. So what happens is every time, what I think is happening is every time I release a video, because I've released a new video, YouTube has donned it worthy that some of my subscribers should get to see it. And so every time I release a new video, new people from my subscriber base get to see what I'm making now. And then they think, oh my God, he's lost his mind <laughs> and uh, unsubscribe. And there's a concept in stand-up comedy called walking the room, where you intentionally um, refuse to get off stage until everybody else leaves. And I think what I'm going to do is walk my entire subscriber base. What's good is that I am getting subscribers in at the same time, so it won't be a clean break, but it'll still be fun. Yeah, I didn't intend for this to happen. <laughs> I wanted to make videos about all sorts of things, and then it just seemed that this was the thing that I had, uh, I was able to offer the best insight into. And the justifications uh, seem to get plainer every day. So. In the trans video, I say something about third genders and what tends to bring about a third gender. And I wanted to add a caveat uh, to that, which is that at one point in the trans videos, I talk about how a third gender comes about. And I, I'm not very specific. A lot of the video, I am not being as specific as I could be because I think it would take too much time. <laughs> you, you have to put some of the pieces together yourself. But one thing that I wanted to clarify was that the how you get a third gender I was describing was a how you get a third gender under a patriarchy. And so I wanted to see if I was correct in that. And if I wasn't, I'd bury the evidence. So I started looking up third genders because I knew I knew I was correct in that Iran and Thailand are pretty obvious examples of a patriarchy, but I wanted to just have a look. What are the other countries? Where are the other genders? And so I came across this website, ranker.com, never heard of it before, a bunch of, I don't know, it looks like a computer might have made it, <laughs> a robot. And um, the article is called, these third genders from cultures around the world prove it's not as black and white as people think. And so it has a list of all these different third gender countries. And I was scrolling through them and sort of getting the impression that there's two, like I was aware that you could get third gender countries like Thailand and Iran, but you could also get um, not just third, but like sometimes four or five different gendered First Nations cultures of, of all sorts of different stripes. And so my theory was that that's because those cultures are pre-agricultural um, or non-agricultural. Other cultures are agricultural. So I was having a look to see if that was correct. And I came across uh, one thing, which was just a chart of all the different, I'm trying to find it, all the different religions and how, yeah, I found this chart and it has all the religions or um, all the big ones that I can think of. So I was thinking, yeah, I'll go through the list and see which ones of these come from cultures that are agricultural or post-agricultural, etc. So I'm, you know, scrolling down the list and uh, the first entry we get to is Wakashu, Japan, also known as Beautiful Youths, the Wakashu of Japan emerged as a widely accepted third gender during the Edo period. The Wakashu were generally adolescent boys who were androgynous in appearance and behavior. Woodblock prints of the time depicted them as playful, sexual, and feminine. Japanese culture portrayed them to be objects of desire for both women and men, at least until Western culture became more prominent and the tradition slowly faded away. So, I was like, hmm, is this pre-agricultural? And I followed the link and came to a Huffington Post article entitled The Androgynous Third Gender of 17th Century Japan. From the 17th to the 19th centuries, gender could neither be binary nor biological. 
It's like, uh, if only you knew what either of those words meant, I'd be so much more eager to hear this conversation. Then it gets into describing how Gen Z refers to the stupidest <laughs> of the millennials and what kind of problems that's caused them. And then it starts talking about these uh, beautiful youths and it also starts talking about they were androgynous, objects of desire for both men and women. They cut their hair off in some uh, ceremony and... Okay. An exhibition dedicated to the portrayal of the wakashu in Japanese art is now on view for the first time in North America. Titled A Third Gender, Beautiful Youths in Japanese Prints, the show features erotic prints from the 17th to 19th centuries in which gender and sexuality are depicted as playful and flexible. <laughs> as Asato Aikida, a guest curator of the exhibition, told the New York Times, even though we have this rich tradition of gender, prints like these are not found in our textbooks. Hmm. We don't do these kinds of exhibitions in Japan. Hmm. The Edo period was characterized by peace, economic growth, isolation from the West, and a rigid social order. Oh, good. Gotta love those rigid social orders. Uh, within this era of tranquility and prosperity blossomed a renewed interest in art, entertainment, and sex, all of which converged in cultural practices like kabuki theater, red light style pleasure districts, and erotic prints known as shunga. Given the strict hierarchies that divided class and age in real life, these realms opened up spaces for fantasies to play out and experimentation to flourish. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, the wild imaginings and the power plays they alluded to are visualized in vivid wood block prints that circulated for cheap throughout two Edo centuries. Within them, older men and women make love to wakashu pictured as flirtatious and desirable. Yeah, interesting. You used that wakashu term. What did that mean again? What was it? Who were these older men and women uh, making love to? What are you distributing here? Ancient Japanese child porn? Is is this like the first example you really want to put on your your third? Like, does that even constitute a gender? Like, if it, I guess it does. And in that sense, that really shows you what a gender is. So I was uh, I was kind of blown away by that, and I wanted to make a reaction to it while it was still fresh in my mind. <laughs> and uh, yeah, anyway, I'm not so I'm not sure about my grander point about uh, post agricultural and pre agricultural or agricultural and non-agricultural but yeah i just thought it, I, I just thought it was weird that they that that was the first one too that you wouldn't even like put that somewhere you know down the list and it also to me perfectly symbolizes exactly how queer theorists treat non-western cultures when it comes to gender where they don't give a shit about the context that it occurs in so long as it could vaguely be used to settle some historical grudge match if there's a dude in a dress if there's like someone doing something a bit gender non-conforming it doesn't matter if it's like through institutionalized pedophilia or like the, the most heinous other cultural practices making it possible they'll just pluck that bit out and be like yoink yep thanks gender got it catch you later yeah i'll do a reaction once i've read them all and keep you posted yoink yep thanks gender got it catch you later